Hello, um, I'm Piotr Jakubovic. I'm a COO of an Irish biotech company based in Cork. Um, we make a um, bio reagent that is found in the blue blood of the horseshoe crab. It is, in a sense, an essential reagent for pharmaceutical quality control. And by doing that reagent, we remove the horseshoe crab from the equation, from the supply chain, um, and remove this, let's say, the harvesting pressure on the horseshoe crab. Um, yeah. So we are basically a company that uh, saves the crabs, and secondly, a guarantees sustainable sourcing of this bioregent called Lau. Yeah, uh, my name is Matthew Marcus. Uh, I'm with Pembient. Uh, we basically bioengineer or biofabricate wildlife products, and uh, we're kind of known for entering that area of, 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 of uh, study, I guess, uh, through the rhinoceros horn. So we're basically trying to uh, create bioidentical rhinoceros horn in order to uh, um, stop the poaching of the rhinoceros. I'm John Baker. I'm the managing director of WildAid. We're a nonprofit based here in San Francisco, focusing on ending the illegal trade in wildlife, um, focusing mostly where demand is the highest in Asia. Uh, we work on shark fin, ivory, rhino horn, um, tiger, pangolin, and a few others. Is there anyone 3D printing parts over at WildAid, or is that just? We try to stop the trade. We try not to make more products. All right. So, um, other than the panel that we just had before us about spider silk, it's, most of this uh, conference seems to have revolved around food and making food out of you know, microorganisms. So I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion on something a little bit different. Uh, and the first thing I want to ask, maybe we'll direct it to you first and we can have a good discussion, is do you find it hard to get people interested in crab blood? Because you're not, I mean, you're telling them it's crab blood, and at first I'm sure they're like, what? But you're not telling them about, you know, <clears throat> coffee or cheese or something, you know, lab-grown meat. You're telling them about something that may, they may feel doesn't affect them. Actually, yes, there's a great surprise to people because the, the thing we do is a the species, the horseshoe crab, is very exotic. So um, people, in many cases, don't know the species and um, are actually surprised that it is useful to our entire pharmaceutical and medical tech industries in a sense that it guarantees the safety of our medical products. So um, yes, there's an initial wow effect, crab blood, and what is it used for? And then comes actually the insight that, yes, we actually use 500 million old species to sustain, to fuel our pharmaceutical industry. And we are based on that. And then comes the insight at the very end that you can actually use business to change the way we produce these kind of uh, regions and make uh, a positive impact on the environment. Mm. And Matt, we've talked over a, a while ago when you were with IndieBio, um, and I thought the most interesting thing was that you were 3D printing the, the same exact proteins, which, you know, sounds very different from what a lot of other people are doing in, in biotech and in life sciences. But could you maybe talk about what's going on with the rhino and why you decided to get involved with that rather than maybe making cheese or something else? Sure, yeah. Um... So, I mean, there, you know, we fall under the umbrella of biofabrication. I think there's two great examples of biofabrication here today, a modern meadow, obviously, with their leather, and also just up on the stage now, Spiber with their jacket. And so, um, you know, those companies that are trying to basically um, replace uh, domesticated, well, maybe not Spiber so much, but uh, animals that are already farmed in some capacity to produce products. Um, you know, we are basically looking to sort of prevent the farming of, of animals um, like the rhinoceros. Um, and that, that the rhinoceros itself, it, it's, it's, it's used, um, you know, the markets here, people don't really understand what, what it's used for, but it's primarily used for a, a carving, uh, a, a, an object that's used to be carved into things like beads, um, you know, combs and things of that nature. And also um, it's used as a medicinal use also. And so I think when we first met, we were really interested in looking at the medicinal things, and, the, and that sort of put us in a food category. But um, subsequent research um, revealed that basically the carving industry is really where 
um, the demand for rhino horn comes from, and that's really where, what drives the poaching of the animal in, uh, in Africa. And so there's a supply chain that's developed over time to uh, basically illegally hunt and kill these animals in Africa and, and export that horn into Asian markets to basically be carved into high-value objects, and then the dust from that carving process ends up uh, in the medicinal markets. John, when you first heard of these companies, did you think, like, is this even going to work, or, or did you think... You know, that's not something that we're interested in. What did, what did you think when you first started hearing about these sorts of companies? Well, I'm no expert on crabs, so uh, I don't really know the story about the crabs that you're uh, focusing on, but we do know a lot about the rhino, and uh, our main issue with rhino is that, one, it's, you know, uh, protected species, so the trade between countries is prohibited. Um, but we, it still happens, I mean. Oh, yeah, it's all illegal, though. Um, and that the trade is now, you know, doing a pretty good job at reducing the population of wild rhinos, where they're killing somewhere between 1,200 and 1,400 reported poached rhinos per year. And just so you know, there's only a little bit more over 20,000 rhinos on the planet. Um, so oh, when well, I and rhinos, not just separate species, but rhinos. Too. All species. Yeah, that's. Um, so the issue for us is we try to reduce demand. That's our main goal. Um, we're not really looking so much. I don't think there's an easy, convenient substitute. Otherwise, we would be doing it by now. So we're really focused on reducing demand and trying to strengthen enforcement. So those are our two main um, priorities. So the technology in our case, I mean, if there was an easy solution, we'd be promoting that, but we don't see that right now. Right now, it helps to complicate things as, from our point of view. You're saying that uh, 3D printing rhino horns and selling them is complicating things. How is that complicating things? Well, the main issue is that um, it's bioidentical, or we can maybe get into the details of that, but the main issue is that you're creating a product that it, in order for it to be successful needs to be promoted. Um, to promote it, you need to tell people why it's good or our main message is telling people this is illegal, this product is killing wildlife, it's you know, contributing to the demise of this species, so the, and it's not a product that people need to survive, it's not like it's curing cancer, so we don't believe there's really any point in encouraging more demand, we're trying to just convince people to stop using it. And we've done it with shark fin to an extent where, um, again, you know, people like to eat shark fin, but you can live without it. And when you tell people what are the true impacts of consuming this product, as soon as they understand it, they say, well, I don't really need to ever do that again. And in China now, demand for shark fin is down by more than 50% since we started our campaign. Do you, I mean, do you think that's the campaign, though, or is there some sort of a cultural shift? I think it's all of the above. We'll take anything we can get, but the campaign helps a lot. Matt, do you, Matthew, do you agree, disagree? No, I mean, it's, demand reduction has its place. I think often in this debate, uh, I mean, John and I sit on kind of opposite sides of the, uh, of the demand curve. I mean, he wants demand to be zero. I want actually uh, demand to be uh, large and growing. But the idea, though, is that um, you know, we will create a sufficient supply to meet that demand. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the companies here are trying to basically replace domesticated animals, and that's a tough, a tough business to be in. As you can see, the things are at $2 per kilogram, $3 per kilogram. There needs to be other optimization to compete with factory farmed uh, uh, commodity products. Um, but, you know, in the illegal wildlife trade, uh, you know, like a rhino horn uh, can trade for, you know, $30,000 per kilogram. Um, so th there's a lot of room to use science and technology to lower that price and actually to make it into sort of a commodity that is readily available and really has no sort of uh, value beyond what a water buffalo horn would be, which is $2 per kilogram. So I mean, we really see that it's easier, or we think it's easier to basically drive the, the, the supply side, enlarge it, um, then try to basically change people's cultural beliefs or perceptions on the demand side because that is sort of like uh, a variable that you have to interact through another variable. I mean, uh, supply is very direct. It's a very direct way of tackling a problem. Uh, demand reduction or changing people's belief systems is a very indirect way of, of tackling the same problem. Is that just hypothesis or do you have evidence that that's actually helping to drive down the cost and, and subsequently the, the, the illegal trade? 
Um, nobody's really biofabricated any wildlife product per se up to until you know till now. I mean, we're we're not actively trading the product right now. We're still working with governments, uh, getting all the stakeholders on board, um, you know, protecting the technology. Uh, but you know, even when we had our message out there, and our message has been spread a lot. I guess there was even a Facebook meme about this a few days ago. But um, you know, in, in the message in of itself, the idea that there will be an inexhaustible supply of horn, that it'll be an abundant supply of this product, um, is sort of a demand reduction message in of itself. I mean, it's targeted at a certain group of people, and those group of pe that group of people are people who basically hoard this, this horn and view it as a store of value. I mean, um, there's been rumors that people want to basically, uh, they don't even want, you know, that there, there's a, this is kind of far-fetched, but there's an idea that there's this, a, a hit put out on the remaining rhino population where people just want people to go out there and kill the rhinos, not even take the horns necessarily, just to drive the species to extinction because everything else that was stockpiled up to that date would just become you know, infinitely valuable because they're just not making it anymore. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of the logic and the, the economic, uh, you know, system that we, we face here. John, it looks like, I'm, I'm going to get to you, but because you've been quiet for a while, but you look like you're itching to say something. No, no, what I was going to say about reducing the price. So, so what has been successful in reducing the price, from our point of view, like with shark fin, when you put the message out and you get people to understand the impacts, we... We highlighted the health impact, it's heavy and heavy metals. The government of China introduced a ban that no government function could serve these products. The, those kind of signals to the, to, to the society basically caused the decline in the consumption and caused the price to go down to the, pat, to the point where people who are selling it are getting out of the business. So what's happening now with ivory, analogously, is that there has been a lot of uh, campaigning, which we've been leading in China on ivory. The government has recently announced the president in September that he wants to end the trade in ivory. It's not done yet, he just said he wants to go there. And those kind of signals in a place like China are pretty important. And in the last 18 months, the price of ivory in China has gone down by more than 50%. And it's because people, the price isn't there because people don't want to buy it. So therefore, they can't command the price anymore. Hmm. So in, with a point on rhino horn, mostly rhino horn, we're talking about Vietnam. And um, Vietnam's, with all due respect, highly corrupt. Um, the government isn't really doing that much to really control the trade in this product. Um, and because of that, <clears throat> it creates this kind of a market. But if they got more serious about enforcing, you might have a different situation. Yeah, so we're talking about like cultural, uh, cultural norms versus government regulation. Peter, what do you have to say about that? Um, well, we at Southwick, we are actually in a bit of more relaxed position. We are actually bringing a legal product to market, which means our industry is actually over-regulated. It's the FDA that says you have to do this and that to bring a pharmaceutical to market. That's why you need law, and as, as it is, you need to have certain specifications of law. So what we need to prove, like you, with that we make a bioidentical product. And then once we meet market specifications, let's say, which is product quality, specific, specific, specific formulations, um, once we meet customer demands, we are there and we are happy. Now, coming back to your discussion, the way I see it, um, there's an interesting question here. It's actually specified. Can I address the question? Please. Good, perfect. Yeah. Um, it's relevant. It, it's, Someone asked if we, uh, what about other animals? What about an, an other species? And that's where I think conceptually, I would like to take a step back and think about what are we actually doing here? We are actually, all of you, we are an apex predator. So we have since ages used technology to subdue, dominate, and exploit nature. So we had big spears for mammoth, small spears for small rodents. We had big nets, and then we needed bigger nets because we actually overfished. And what we have here as a technological movement is a very positive application of the technology. We mimic nature, let's say in its physical form, in its chemical form, now in its biological form, to build something that actually contributes to other creatures of the planet. And as such, yes, I think it's very important to consider all life forms for a simple reason. We take them as inspiration to build things to survive. And the more of them we can basically keep alive, the more of them, the more we can sustain our own existence on that planet, which is a closed system. So the question is just, 
how do we apply that technology? And um, if we successfully sell rhino horn, right? If we save the crabs and the humans who make money, uh, do we give back? To whom do we give back the delta of our success? Let's say our success being, you can, monet, can say, you can measure it in money, or you can measure it in habitat or food, the things we take away from, from those animals. So by making steaks, we free up, we uh, occupy pasture. By making steaks artificially, we could free them and let jungle crawl back, which is actually the main, main um, let's say, holdout for biodiversity on the planet. So that would be my, my basic position is, it's not essentially about one animal, it's not the rhino. We love rhinos because they're mammals, we identify with mammals, we love pandas, we love, well, horseshoe crabs look like alien face huggers, but we still love them. And, and, but the thing is, it's actually about all of them. And by doing these things, we explore the possibility to build a new way to help those animals, to take pressure off them. And, okay, one can discuss one or other species and might not be that important, including us, actually, but biodiversity, life itself, it's very important. And that's why I think this whole movement here is very important and very exciting because it's the first time actually on the planet where we use, can make agriculture happen without animals. I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like people are more interested in saving the animals that are cute, <laughs> right? I mean, you have the cute panda, you have the tiger, you have, they, those seem to be something easier, yeah. but uh, it seems like that would be very hard to replicate in a lab right now. I mean, the way when you're talking now, I think like, wow, can you, can you guys make some, some synthetic bluefin tuna? That would help. <laughs> <laughs> Someone here has got to be working on that. <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty sure. Um, it also kind of takes out the, you know, I don't want to offend anyone growing meat in a lab here, but, um, you know, there's the argument that at least you're not killing any life and maybe vegetarians would eat that. Uh, a lot of vegetarians I know would be, they seem very, very hesitant when I'm asking them if they would eat lab-grown meat, so I don't know how that's going to work. Maybe they'll come around, I don't know. Um, I am a meat eater, but this takes out the creepiness factor as well. Um, I want to get back to um, flooding the market because you can 3D print, but it's got to take a long time to do that. How do you, and I know this is a theme of the whole thing, but how do you make enough rhino horn or crab blood to, fl to flood the market and make it you know, cost, more cost effective to go with what you're doing than it is to just go find a crab or go, go get a rhinoceros horn? Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, one of the one of the nice things about working in wildlife, again, um, and even the crabs, um, are that these are all high value uh, products. Uh, like I said, thirty thousand dollars per kilogram. I think yours is like a million dollars per kilogram or something like that. Yeah. So, so they're very high value products. And so, whereas everybody else has the challenge of basically out competing, like I said, a factory farm, um, we have we don't have that challenge. Our challenge is more along the lines of of, uh, and this this is a difference too, is because these things are so cheap, like uh, from from a from a factory farming perspective, people need to differentiate. So you hear about fluffier egg whites or stronger silk. We're different. We want to be exactly identical uh, because the real value is in basically creating more of this product. It's in demand. I mean, it just there's just not a supply to meet that demand. And so, um, you know, we think you know our, our max demand for us would probably be about 300,000 kilograms uh, per year. You know, that's not necessarily a very large amount of a product to make. Uh, and right now, you know, uh, market demand is probably six thousand dollars per kilogram, um, as far as a legal market supply. There was also that incident in Kenya where uh, they took all the illegal elephant tusks and they burned them to tell people this is not going to work. Uh, One hundred twenty tons. Yeah, but I mean, doesn't reducing the market make it? To your point, you know, going out and killing all the rhinos, you know, doesn't that make it? more valuable when there's less supply? Well, those tusks were already out of the market. Those tusks had been confiscated through seizure, so they were sitting in a warehouse having to be stored. And there's, it's like, you know, when you bust like a ton of heroin, you're not gonna go put it back out on the market, right? You have to destroy it. Um, so it's the same principle with um, these ivory tusks. I mean, sad because they, uh, they do have some intrinsic value, but as soon as you put them back on the market, you're just fueling the trade again. Yeah, but the market does know that 20 tons have been destroyed, right? So they 120. So now it's more valuable anything that's already on the marketplace. 
Yeah, although at the same time, I just mentioned that our surveys in eight cities of China show that price over the last 18 months has gone down by more than half. So the, the, the people who, are, who would otherwise be buying this understand that this is something that they're not, not going to do anymore. Or I think that those, those numbers are kind of disputed, though, right? I mean, as far as price falling? OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the survey I show, I can show you the study, the study I saw. That's what, they, that's what it said. And our uh, own people in Hong Kong have confirmed same, same declines. We're talking a lot about you know, government regulation, intervention, working with the government to get people to change. Um, what have been some of maybe some, you might be able to answer this, and you might be able to answer this. You touched on the FDA. What are some of the barriers to working with the government to getting this to market? Okay. Yeah, let's go with, you and then it, with us, it's not necessarily the government. It's rather, let's say, industry conglomerates that have an interest to keep the business like it is. Now, our business is involved since the 70s, when the discovery was made that actually LAL, or let's say, the singular cell of the host to crop immune system, is capable of detecting endotoxins in such a way that it clots and shows basically us. And this is used in every single... We're, we're mandated, basically vaccine, things that go in your blood, things that go in your nervous system, they need to be tested with this LAL. And uh, so back then they discovered, okay, we don't need to use rabbits anymore. Statistical test of rabbits, you know, lots of rabbits dying and actually uh, moreover, uh, commercially, rabbit, standard testing rabbit, it's an expensive thing. So you kind of, you have to bring in a cost factor into that. So they discovered it's actually a viable business to build the pharmaceutical industry on uh, this specific testing, let's say, platform. Um, after a while, business ran, and as it goes, once structures um, come to, to, to try, like pass a certain size, they focus on certain type of innovations, being, let's say, cost effectiveness or, or the lack, let's say, the right technological timing to bring in a change into the industry. Let's say, in that case, remove really the horseshoe crap from the equation and bring in a, a, a sustainable so technological solution. Well, neither the first nor the second thing happened. And thus, I think what I would describe is just now uh, a gut more gut feeling than a fact. It's that these people, they make business, and it's great. And they kind of, they're happy about the status quo. And whatever comes down the line, they're either not able to change it for now, or they were not able to change it for now. And they, um, yeah, they, they just continue making money. So is this, you're making bioidentical crab blood, or just the part that We are, we are making, need? I mean, effectively our product is the lysed immunologic cell, mm -hmm. the amoebocyte of the host crab. So we actually make the real thing, mm -hmm. just without the crab. But you're, you're not isolating the actual part that you need. You're just making crab blood. We make the raw material mm -hmm. in upstream and then the downstream we isolate. Because they're buying the raw material, is that why? Or? They buy the raw material and they buy formulations and they buy, let's say, cartridge, uh, cartridge kits. For, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very highly fragmented market in the sense that there are numerous medical products that need to be tested in very specific ways. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so large products adapted to that need. So I guess I'm, I'm asking this because I'm wondering if you're just catering to the market because they're looking for crab blood or if, they're, if you can sell a better, you know, well, yeah. part, I mean, if you're just isolating I, the one part that they need. I mean, the nice thing is we have a product that's superior, mm -hmm. which we claim to be superior, in the sense that we need to up, finish our upscaling. Again, same technological challenge as a platform, so we need to upscale that. And when this is done, many things happen at once. A, we have a product that is lower in quality variation we have a potentially much cheaper product in production cost. We have removed seasonal limitations. You have to imagine right now, two months in a year, if you live in the Delaware Way region, you can you have a catching license, you go into the water, you catch a crab, you throw it on a boat, you throw it on a truck, you drive to a factory, you step a needle into its heart, and you bleed really dry. And from the blood you extract LL. Well, we do that actually um, in a simple reactor. So uh, it's no seasonal limitations, no geographic limitations, and at the very end, in a rising market, in a rising demand market, we unlock the bottleneck, which is there. So while LAL is a high-value product, and a toxin and pathogen testing has many applications down the line that haven't reached other sectors, and potentially there's a huge benefit basically from basically yeah. bringing that to market. Yeah. And John, you come from this at a, at a different, the, the, the opposite end here where, you know, you're 
you're working at a nonprofit, you're trying to you know, get people to, to respect the animal, it's a living being. And tech has the tendency to freak people out sometimes. We're, you know, we're, we hear about robots taking our jobs and drones spying on us. Does this kind of technology scare you? Is this like freaky, weird? No, no, the is, yeah. technology is not at all the issue. I mean, if we had a simple solution, I'd love it. Um, but, you know, our main issue is we're trying to take the pressure off. I mean, we'll be happy when, you know, close to zero or zero rhinos are being killed every year. And just to put everything in perspective, back in 2008, only 14 rhinos were killed. And mm -hmm. it's only since then that it's risen and, and increased up to the level of 1,200, 1,400. So that's just in the last few years. Mm. So it can, it can change quickly. Hmm. We have an interesting question at the bottom here. Uh, Marcus, it, or Matt, excuse me, Matthew, Marcus. Uh, it looks like it's directed to you. Um, what if you harvest wild rhino horn for free and then label it synthetic and push it through Pembian's legal supply chain? I don't know that that's how it works. That seems kind of weird. Um, yeah, I don't uh, know that that's there how it is, works. I mean, people want to farm rhino, but uh, that's not really actually done right now. I mean, because basically the trade is is banned. I mean, so even uh, domestically in South Africa, there's well, there's a contested ban. So you can't really trade in that product effectively. And that's sort of what kind of makes it valuable in some respects. It's kind of like, the, you know, partly sort of like the drug war and a lot, of, I mean, as a drug war to me is a good analogy and I mean, some people don't like that analogy, but I do. I mean, I come from the state of Washington and, you know, we legalize marijuana and you can see the drop in cross-border trade in marijuana between U.S. and Mexico. I mean, it, it, you know, and same thing with prohibition. Our country went through a period of prohibition and then and we realized that engendered crime and corruption, a lot of other negative externalities and we uh, went back to a more rational system. And so, uh, you know, I think in this case, this to me is just a logical episode application of this technology. In fact, it, to me, it's the most pressing and, and, and realistic way of using this technology to, to have this kind of impact. Where do you see this working so far for you in your business? Where is it working? Uh, so, I mean, again, we, 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 there's, you know, the people have asked us and we want to collect data. There's, if you go into the wildlife uh, trafficking area, first, first of all, because it's a licit market, there's not much data. And second of all, there's kind of a surprising lack of data collection where it could be collected, even just at the carcass level. Um, I know with elephants, that's been a big issue. Um, so I mean, we've been trying to basically monitor our, um, you know, uh, announcement, because a, a lot of times, you know, markets respond to information even before product is, is, is released. And, you know, last year was not a great year for rhinos, but, um, you know, we were only sort of had this sort of a viral inflection point in the mid-2000s, I mean, mid-July mid, 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 mid of 2015. Um, and we did look at, and last year, it's actually, rhino poaching was the first year it went down in South Africa in, in 10 years, what, eight, seven years or eight years? Yeah, I mean, it did go up over the continent overall. It did go up slightly, but at 3%, whereas before it was climbing at 20 to 46%. So we're not claiming that that was us. You know, you don't you don't have like a big market share in the rhino trade yet, do you? Well, or we don't have any market share because our product's not, not being sold. But basically, okay. we're telling people, hey, what you were storing and what you thought was a store of value is not truly a store of value. It's going to be made in abundance. Uh, you know, all you know, my shirt buttons will be ivory or rhino horn in the future. You know, all these cups and all these desks and all these things will be made of these biomaterials. They're not going to be rare anymore, people. So don't hoard them. Don't kill the animals because your investment is going to go to zero. What about the argument that, you know, um, a lot of people have an issue with blood diamonds, and then there's these synthetic diamonds that are so much cheaper, but it's not, it has not brought down the, the cost of a diamond ring, a real diamond ring? Um, yeah, okay, well, synthetics, the synthetic diamonds, it's a good, it's a good analogy. I mean, the, the thing with synthetic, synthetic diamonds is that you're competing against a, a legal monopoly. Uh, you can't go and basically sell your synthetic diamond as a wild diamond. Um, what we're competing against is an illicit market. And so, you know, if we were to sell biofabricated horn at a price much below uh, natural horn, which we intend to do, there's nothing to really stop people from taking advantage of that arbitrage opportunity, buying our horn and passing it off as wild horn. And there's really no way you can get your money, but there's no court of law that's going to say, oh, yeah, sorry, you were ripped off here. You bought, you know, uh, biofabricated horn when you intended to buy wild horn. That's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, we, we view this as a little bit different. We're not necessarily... I mean, a lot of times people compare us to, you know, you have a legal market and a legal market and you're a synthetic and people want the organic or whatever. It's not the case here. You know, we have a, an illicit market. And uh, it's funny because I have people who, who will tell me that markets need to be regulated and markets can't perform or function without government intervention, except for the black market, which will somehow self-organize and will defeat you in all ways. So it's very weird to hear this kind of dichotomy sometimes. 
What do you, what do you think, John? Well, I think the problem is that um, it's hard to regulate. You're talking about the law enforcement also having to tell the difference between a legal product and an illegal product. And I know they have the technology to put markers and do all this kind of thing. Um, and mostly our concern is that, I mean, if we were talking about some other species that wasn't so close to the edge, you know, it might be a different conversation. But we just believe that by going down this path, you potentially like let the genie out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. And, you know, the rhinos are the ones that are going to end up paying the price. So our position, I should say that we've been here before, not with uh, having a, a synthetic product as a substitute, but in, nine, in the early 1990s, there was a rhino poaching crisis. Um, the number of rhinos was way down, much lower than it is today. And the biggest market for rhino horn was Taiwan. And today, Taiwan doesn't consume any rhino horn. Um, what happened? So this is the story. So what happened is there was a campaign, uh, which we were involved in, um, and there was the introduction of the international uh, convention prohibiting the trade of rhino horn between countries. And then there was the resolve of the government in Taiwan at the time to actually enforce the law um, and institute a, a national law of their own saying this is you know, illegal to trade rhino horn. Um, there were threat of sanctions in 1993 by President Clinton, all those kind of pressure took hold, and today we don't ever speak of Taiwan when we talk about rhino horn. Um, and since then, uh, the, the wealth in countries like China and Vietnam has increased, you know, since, uh, you know, 20, 2008, that's when it really started to increase. So that's why I say, you know, we've been here before, we kind of know how to fix it. We need to put all these pieces in place, um, and it requires, you know, some effort and, you know, and, the hard part here is getting the government of Vietnam on board and, you know, getting a campaign that has enough momentum to really get people's attention and change people's mind. And so far we have Jackie Chan and Yao Ming and David Beckham and Prince William and, you know, we're doing what we can. <laughs> we're about to put some new campaign material out with Jay Chow, who, if you're not in the, if you're not Chinese or Taiwanese, you may not know who that is, but it's like the Justin Timberlake of the China um, speaking world, and you know we're going to keep making an effort of this, you know, and do our best. What's um What's a species that you see uh, as what's the most endangered species? What's the which animal is the most in trouble right now? Well, there's a lot of like <laughs> that you can't even start. I mean, there's a lot of species we've never even heard of, like. Various sharks and what's the Mex in Mexico? What's the fish? The, the, the vaquita. The vaquita, right? That's probably That's the most a, endangered. There's like you know 60. These are um, marine mammals, like a porpoise, um, also being victimized by wildlife trade, which is a whole nother story. Are, are most of them from wildlife trade or just human? No, no, many of them are because of ecological change, whether it's climate change, whether it's loss of habitat, whether it's pollution, like the frogs and the amphibians and that kind yeah. of stuff. So people aren't just poaching, we can't really, unless we stop people from polluting and getting into their habitat, we can't really do anything about. But are there any uh, animals that uh, people are, are just destroying from illegal trade other than the rhino or the crab that, I mean, maybe there's someone thinking they want to get in on this, you know, tech startup idea. Bluefin tuna. <laughs> Someone can grow that bluefin tuna. Okay, all right. Um, um, I think I think an important aspect of this is I'm, I'm happy not being in the trenches between you guys. So, just saying, uh, um, in a way, uh, I think a very important part is that it's biodiversity. It's not necessarily one species. Um, it's like interlocking ecosystems. It's let's say genetic biodiversity, species biodiversity. So um, I think, uh, in a way, I wonder if there could be a compromise in the sense that we have this flagship animal and we use a specific technology for this flagship animal. But we go forward, let's say tactically in this case, because in a way we, okay, we accept that we might, that the animal might jump the gun, maybe because we push that or not, because we don't have data on that, it's explorative. 
But then, strategically, what we want to build is actually a platform that reduces our this destruction of animal habitats or even gives us the possibility to reconstruct animal habitats. Like, right now, we're speaking about the rhino or the crab, but in the jungles, day by day, we lose so many of them. And in aquatic habitats, the oldest habitat on the planet, we lose so many of them. And we're speaking about one species, but we're speaking about thousands who, 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 who vanish forever, thousands who have therapeutics, who have materials, who, have who are species that are our future. And they are, they are like not, we see them as animals, but they are part of us in a way that they come from, came from the same evolutionary tree. And they are basically our reservoir to, to sustain us. They sustain our, so how do we say that? Our, our biosphere, yeah. yeah. Um, I think someone's asking a really interesting question that's a whole other can of worms, but um, how about bringing back extinct species? Mm -hmm. And there are people that are working on that, and no one here that I know of is working on that right now, but. Oh, here. What? Here. Long, the Long oh, Foundation, oh, right there. Well, <laughs> I, didn't, I meant on the panel. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Yeah, there is, a, yeah, right, 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 yeah. We've, we've met before, but um, there are people that are working on bringing back the woolly mammoth, this lady over here, um, but, I, you know, there may be some more recent, maybe not the woolly mammoth, but maybe some more recent species that have been wiped off the face of the earth that maybe someone might bring back. I don't know that who's working on that other than... Oh, well, I mean, in rhinos, uh, there's a lot of great work by the San Diego Zoo and, the, and their, their conservation lab down there. I mean, the, the northern white rhino is a subspecies of rhino. There's only three of them left in existence. Um, uh, I think they're all in Kenya right now. And so they're basically, from a re reproductive standpoint, they're all too old to reproduce. So that, that they're effectively extinct uh, now. Um, and, uh, Would that be difficult for you to get... I mean, you're, you're working on the, the keratin protein. Would that be maybe something more difficult to work on? Oh, no, I mean, it's a, it's a separate thing. I think, oh, you mean extinct, de-extinction? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's not our bag of tricks. Um, but um, basically, Oliver Riders, the, 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 the professor, uh, scientist down there at San Diego, and they, they have uh, what they call a frozen zoo. And so they're basically looking to develop a project whereby they can kind of re... Because uh, it's not really extinct. It's almost like kind of pulling it almost from the brink of extinction. The northern white rhino, what they intend to do is basically uh, bring those northern white rhinos to term in southern white rhinos, which are more populous. And so the idea is maybe they can, we can kind of build back up a breeding stock and therefore, you know, kind of rescue that, that particular subspecies from extinction. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're almost out of time, but um, I did want to ask each one of you if you could save a species that's, you know, plunging into extinction because of, you know, over-harvesting, which one would it be? Choose your favorite kid. Mm -hmm. This has got to be really hard for you because you're working with a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. I know that's tough. But I know. Uh, obviously, I'm all I'm all in on rhinos, and you're all in on crabs, right? I know. <laughs> and you've mentioned the bluefin tuna a lot, so I don't know if that's yours, but uh, that would be nice. I mean, I can't choose. There's so many tigers are are probably the most. I mean, there's only like three thousand five hundred tigers left, and their habitats disappearing. Um, is that in the wild or in zoos In the and wild, everything? there's more in the zoos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Matthew, I know that you work on the rhino, but I also know we've talked before about elephant tusk and all sorts of other animals, the pangolin. Is there anything else that you would want to, I mean, those are still around. Is there some animal that you'd want to bring back? Bring back or, or work on? Or, you know what, let's go with both. All right, well, I mean, we do keratin mainly, mainly, and rhino horn is a unique horn. It's all keratin. Uh, there's other animals that have keratin in them. Uh, pangolin, which is a scaly anteater that's also endangered. They have keratin in their scales, and their scales are consumed for medicinal uses. Uh, but unfortunately, also the meat's also a delicacy, so um, we may not have really a big impact there in that market. The same thing with... Uh, there's a cask of uh, the hornbill, which is a, a bird. Uh, that cask is used to carve trinkets from. Uh, it's also an endangered animal. Um, uh, that's something we're also interested in looking at, potentially. And obviously ivory, because ivory is iconic. Uh, it, I think when I talk about rhino horn, people's eyes glaze over. They don't really understand its history, its use as a medicine, but also its use as a carving um, a substance. Uh, but people understand ivory really well. And so, um, you know, from that perspective, uh, yeah, I, I'm. I would be interested in working on ivory also. And Is that just a different protein? 
No, it's totally different. It's, totally it's, different. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's, uh, it's, it's more like teeth. It's like uh, ivory is like a tooth. It's a living structure. Uh, you know, uh, a horn is like a, fin like a fingernail or a piece of hair. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. And what about you? Um, okay, first of all, the question was, um, before that, horse crab blood goes 30K by quart, which is a liter. Yeah. Um, Someone asked Dracula. <laughs> Thank Someone you. asked about the cost. So, <laughs> yeah. And then um, my actual animal, it's actually the human. Because I believe, I actually believe that we are destroying our own habitat. There's no species on the planet that depopulates. There's quite, there's like billions of us still there. We're yeah, but in a way, I mean, such, I wouldn't say stupidity, but we have actually, we are survivor. Mm -hmm. I mean, every one of you will kill I mean, kill there's quite a, a few of us that could 3D print a human right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and all of you can kill a T-Rex yeah. or an ice bear because we are better than them, well, our tool is our mind. Mm -hmm. But in a way, there's no species on the planet that goes so badly with its hives than us. We, pop, we, like, we, uh, we dump trash, we um, toxins, everything. And effectively, in the, in the long run, I mean, we spoke about bringing meat to other planets and colonize our planets. Do we, do we really think that biology will be the same on other planets as on this? that it will, won't adapt. I think this is the only place so far we've found in the universe, right, which has these kind of parameters, a class M planet and so on, that gives us this, and we treat it really badly because we are, in a way, a very successful species in dominating and developing technology and using this to dominate, I mean, again, I said dominate, to exploit, to control, and we have not involved our social systems have evolved far, but we have not evolved enough to stop that. And hopefully, time is on our side. And I think projects like these give us the potential to try new tools out. But these tools are technologies, and they can't get there alone. They need support from state organizations in order to run, to regulate, to run these experiments, to give feedback. They need support from citizens who understand that what's behind that and how these approaches actually can be brought into fruition. So um, I think we as a species, we have to look out for ourselves and not only look after other creatures, which are part of us, but uh, yeah. Well, thank you all. It's been a really good discussion and I appreciate that everyone took a different side and shared how they feel. Thank you so much.